Hi, welcome to Hampshire Piano. My name's Craig, and I have a piano to show you. This is a 1904 Bluthner Style 6 Aliquot Grand. It is easily amongst the most desirable medium-sized grands ever produced. It has some unique features, and I want to introduce you to them. As you can see, it's a very pretty piano. It was originally finished in ebony, though that has faded somewhat. But it shows all the classic Luthner style points. It's got a nice soft faceted lid with a rounded edge and the case has the classic solid Luthner beading with the 45 degree chamfer. Always nice details. This keeps the case from getting beat up in case somebody pushes it against a wall. Yeah. But that little swoop and corner there is kind of a Bluthner signature. You can spot a Bluthner by that. And it has these really nice tapered legs. Better. There we go. There's solid maple, possibly beech, being European. And they are attached with threaded dowels. You can see the the lyre with its ornamental details. All these details say Bluthner. Just to start out, there's just a most exquisite set of ivories. Beyond all the normal details of a fine piano that make Bluthner special, this is one of their aliquot pianos. And what that means is that it has a special secondary set of strings called aliquot strings that are built in to the system and are designed to add a little extra brilliance and life to the upper octaves of the piano. And what they are is an unstruck string suspended above the normal sets of strings and when notes are struck that are in sympathy with them, they vibrate and produce their own blending tone. Now let me take a look at how the system is installed. Um, basically two elements to it. If you look here, you can 
can see that there's a set of these terminating pins on the bridge. And in this sense, the sympathetic string is in a one-to-one -one relationship with the main speaking length. At this point, they decide that that's getting to be a bit long, so they move to a two-to-one relationship. And that requires attaching these pins to their own flying bridge here. And up through this section, you can see that the speaking lengths are at a one-to-two ratio. And up here you'll find that these strings, when plucked, are an octave higher than the main note. And these up here are tuned the same. So let's see how they put this together. Up in the pin field, you can see they had to make room and include a fourth pin. Makes for kind of a wide spacing of the strings down through here, but good engineers made the room. Now that fourth string, as I said, it rides in a plane slightly higher than those of the unison. As you can see, it rides off of a little nub to the side of each A-graph. At the damper, the elevated string has its own little damper to control it because once any string is this long, it's got capacity to ring longer than you might want it to, so they need dampers. Here are the termination pins in this section. You can see how they plug into their bridge. And they come down you can see they're independent of the bridge and then come back here and mount to their own hitch pin rail. Now up here in the treble they accomplish the same phenomenon by using capo bar a grass. As you can see, they function on the same design as the other ones. They have a little nub to the side that holds the aliquot string a little higher. And that aliquot string comes over to these termination pins, which are actually, this time, mounted right in the bridge. So, they get their impulse directly from the bridge and deliver it directly back to the bridge. They, too, have their own elevated hitch pin line. And as I was saying, these over here, these ones receive their impulse from the soundboard and return it to the soundboard. But they do both work. Okay, let's see if I can't uh, demonstrate some of the theory behind the aliquot stringing system. Um, up in this section, what you have is the system is set up to have aliquot strings that are basically one half the length 
of your normal speaking string. So half the length in basic theory gives you the octave. And that is what these are tuned to. Here's A4. And that one is tuned to A5. Here is A5. And and so it goes up the scale. Now it's important to point out that I'm overexciting these wires when I do that. They never receive that much energy from the soundboard. Because if you hear it, play them. Their contribution to the note is pretty subtle. if that's coming through on the recording but it's it's a subtle change in the the vowel sound coming out of the piano it shifts from an oo to an ah Okay, now up here in the high treble, we come to the transition between the shorter and the longer duplexing. You can look at this in one of two ways. Going this direction, we felt that these strings were getting a bit long, and so they thought they'd go for the octave instead of the fundamental, or coming from this direction, they thought they were crowding the, uh, the space a bit and they couldn't fit any more of these in, so instead of sticking with the octave, they switched to the fundamental. But in either case, there's a transition, and it makes it such that the aliquot string gets its energy directly from the bridge rather than from the soundboard as these ones over here do. Does it make for a more pronounced effect? I'm not sure. Let's just take a look at them and take a hear of them. And there's the So the progression remains the same. And the real question is, is can you hear it? And for generosity, we'll go to the longest one. Now, no educational video about a Bluthner grand piano would be complete without familiarizing the audience with 
Bluthner's famous patent action. And this is just the most gorgeous, perfect example I have ever seen. So I'm just a little agog at it at the moment, but Bluthner had their own special. This is Bluthner's patent granted action. The patent action is the name by which it is known. So, Let's see if I can't get enough odd angle pictures here to explain how it works. Um, well, like any piano action, you have of course the key which raises up the mechanism underneath the shank so in the end the hammer goes up always that same end result but in this action the power is delivered to this abstract there's what amounts to the knuckle right here is the jack the jack of course is attached to the key. If I can get over here, there is, well, that's the bottom end of the abstract with the repetition spring stuck in it. All right. And there. see down the line are the jacks as you can see jack comes up there's the button in the back Going on the final one, you see that the the jack escapes, and that's how back check occurs. It's a little out of regulation, not happening quite as smoothly as it should, but and this action doesn't have quite the feel of your standard Hertz or Art action, but it is a wonderfully smooth, precise action, great subtlety, and it's practically uncheatable. So, these were offered from, I think, the 1850s to the 1920s. And so they're uh, they're a known element, and they take a bit of a specialist to take care of them because they're a little time consuming in their their fiddliness, and maybe that's what uh, you know spelled their obsolescence eventually. But. These were a favor, favorite of many fine pianists, and they are a good action. And with this, I think we've pretty much covered Bluthner. Thank you. Bye-bye.